throughout your studies, you'll no doubt hear a lot about the concept of liberalism and the relation to law. Now, the common law emerged out of a period of political and philosophical change in the Age of Enlightenment that's often characterised as liberalism. And while you may not have a great deal of interest in history now, it is still important today. It's the language that law speaks. It's the culture of the law. And understanding liberalism can help us explain why the law is the way it is, why certain choices have been made in designing the law, and it will also help us anticipate changes that may occur in the future, or the way in which judges may make decisions on the basis of these ideas. The term itself, liberal, is used in many different ways and can be quite confusing. In Australia, we have a Liberal Party, which is a Conservative Party. In the United States, the term liberal is often used to refer to progressive parties. In fact, conservative commentators often use the word liberal as an insult, as though there was something inherently wrong about the idea of liberalism, even though many of their own political beliefs are built out of liberalism. And then we come to neoliberalism, which has an unlikely set of supporters and adherents, and uh, often seems to oppose liberalism in many of its beliefs, and that's something we're going to return to later. Understanding liberalism means understanding something about the time in which it emerged. And it came about at the same time as the development of the modern state and the development of the modern legal system. So it's not a surprise that these things are connected together. We're talking about the 17th century. We're talking about the Enlightenment, the start of the Industrial Revolution, the start of the Scientific Age, a great time of change. It was a time where we threw off medieval ideas, particularly the idea that we should be governed by kings and nobles. Democracy is an important foundation of liberalism, but of course, even then, democracy wasn't something that everyone got access to. In fact, women didn't get the vote for another 200 years. Well, of course you didn't. You're not eligible to vote. Well, why not? Because virtually no one is. Women, peasants, chimpanzees, <laughs> lunatics, lords. That's not true. Lord Nelson's got a vote. He's got a boat, boring. <laughs> Marvellous thing, democracy. Look at Manchester. Population 60,000, electoral roll 3. So even though democracy wasn't uh, quite what it should be, this was the start of the changes and the start of the development of the modern ideas of democracy. This was a time when humanism became important, where society was still fundamentally Christian, uh, but increasingly we looked to rational reasons for uh, the decisions that we made, and the ideas that we had of justice came from rational philosophical debate rather than questions of belief, although ultimately they often ended up looking strangely similar. Now, it is difficult to provide a comprehensive definition of what liberalism is, so it's probably easier to have a look at some of the core important elements of liberalism to give you an idea of the cluster of beliefs and attitudes that surround liberalism. So I'll just run through each of these in turn. The first is the concept of rights. This is the idea that everyone possesses these fundamental rights that can't be bargained away, they can't be something that you can negotiate away, and that these rights are absolutely part of your political and personal identity. Now, obviously, most people didn't get those rights until much, much later, but this is an important part of liberalism, an important foundation of the legal system. So we no longer treated people fairly and justly because that was the right thing to do, or it was some obligation of the rulers. It was because people possessed those fundamental rights to due process, right to life, etc., etc. The next issue is equality, and equality is not only a right in itself, but it's also the access to justice and the ability to actually assert those rights, and that also means access to a justice system. Another element is parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is very important because the power comes from the people. Now, you may vote for representatives to exercise that sovereignty, and you may only vote for those representatives every few years. But again, this is a very important element of liberalism that moves it away from the idea of having, you know, hopefully a benevolent king as a ruler to power being something that's codified and expressed through the system. And that leads us to the next concept, which is rule of law. And the quote um, in the gendered terms of its, of its time was, that we were before a rule of law, not men, which means that we, as a, as a system, 
as, as a society are ruled by the laws of society, not by the whims of rulers. This is very, very important. And it means that nobody is above the law. And it means that um, everything has to be done properly. Everything has to be done properly and transparently. Uh, now, this, like many of the other liberal values, have become under attack in recent times with the rise of executive power. And both types of uh, political organisations have been uh, very active in undermining rule of law by using these, these special executive and emergency powers that don't abide by the rules of the system. But that's a topic for another day. The next element of liberalism I want to mention is utilitarianism. And this is the idea of the greatest good for the greatest many. And this is very important as a foundation for you know, organising society. But it always has to be read in the context of the idea of rights as well. That you can never fritter away the rights of individuals for the good of, of, of the many. And this is one of the common misapprehensions people have about democracy, that it's about mob rule. It's about just what the most people want. And one of the important elements of the liberal idea of democracy is the protection of people. And that democracy exists to protect individuals and to protect groups from that rule of mob. And if just because the mob don't like someone, it's, that's not enough. There has to be a fundamental uh, harm that's being done that to, uh, to limit the rights of others. And finally, an important concept in liberalism is the idea of property. And again, this came about at that time of social change. It also came about at the birth of capitalism. So when we talk about property, we're quite often not necessarily talking about your right to own your own house and your own um, bits and pieces, but it's about the ability of people to own capital, the, 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 the property that makes other property, property that makes wealth, uh, the means of production in Marx's terms. And it is very difficult to separate liberalism from property quite often. And uh, quite often the right to property is, is very much foregrounded in rights systems. And even our concept of rights itself as something that we own as individuals is something that is very closely tied to the ideas of property of that, of that era. Now, liberalism has been a dominant way of thinking throughout the development of our legal system. And in various periods, it's become more and more important. And in the 20th century, the threat of totalitarianism and World War II made the importance of ideas like rights, uh, the key parts of these systems, very important. And this is where we got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was an international acceptance of the idea of rights, uh, very much in response to the atrocities of World War II. And it was interesting here that the rights were reconceptualized as essential human rights, that you didn't own them just by being a citizen or just by being um, a member of a society. These were things that were seen as fundamentally human. Now, it's not always been good news for liberalism. I mean, there's been a lot of criticism of liberalism, particularly in the late 20th century. And it's certainly true that liberalism can sustain the status quo and often can provide a mythology of, of justice and fairness where it doesn't actually exist. It can actually obscure inequality. You can have a situation where everyone has access to the justice system. Technically, you can go to court, but in reality, if you don't have the resources to litigate, that right of access and that equality is, is illusory. There's also been uh, substantial criticism from a lot of critical perspectives, gender, race, class, sexuality, that law obscures structural inequalities. And it often does this by deeming a certain way of being to be normal, which is, you know, white, male, heterosexual, privileged. And there's certainly been very valid criticisms of legal liberalism from the idea that when it says every, every everyone has this right or does this in a certain way, that it's only talking about a certain point of view. However, there is a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And in criticising liberalism, which we should do, we should also be very aware to maintain the elements that are under threat and the things that we want to protect. The idea of rights, for instance, are very much under threat, particularly from the idea of rights and responsibilities, which is a very, very passive aggressive way of undermining rights by saying, you know, well, every right also comes with a responsibility. 
a fundamentally liberal, fundamentally liberal notion of rights would say that your rights extend to the point at which you're interfering with other people's rights. They're quite robust and say that you can never, ever bargain those away or have them taken away from you. Whereas this idea of rights and responsibilities, which pops up now, is really saying, well, rights are only notional and are only subject to this idea of social responsibilities. So that's one area where um, legal liberalism and the you know rule of law has come under fire. There are other areas. Uh, I mentioned earlier the rise of executive power and how that has undermined rule of law. And the last thing I want to talk about is neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is a really strange beast. It's an era of politics which purports to be a new version of liberalism, but in many ways it directly opposes the old ideas of liberalism. While neoliberalism emerged from the conservative politics of Reagan and Thatcher in the 1980s, it's something that dominates the political discourse today. Neoliberalism is the idea that we let the market make decisions, that the free market and the economy is the source of any decisions that we make in society. And you can see how it sort of makes sense when times are good and markets are booming and everyone's making money. It seems like the market is a benevolent creature that, 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 uh, that, that acts for the good of everyone, or at least the people who are making the money. And neoliberalism argues against interventionist politics. The idea is that we let the market be free. And neoliberalism is also tied to the rise in the power of the stock market. The stock market never used to be important as it is as it is today. And today we see governments taking a back seat to making decisions based on what the stock market will do. Now, obviously, at the time of recording this, this is at the time when the uh, COVID pandemic has broken out and we're seeing governments making very different sorts of decisions. In emergencies, suddenly we're realising that the market is not the benevolent uh, god that um, some would like it to be, and the market can be quite, quite brutal. And in Australia, we're actually seeing a, uh, a conservative government making quite socialist decisions on, on, a, uh, on social welfare and social protection. So we do live in strange times, but I have no doubt that neoliberalism will continue to live on. I mentioned before that it is often opposed to liberalism, and one clear example of that is privatised prisons. The idea that any part of society is better run by private industry than the state runs directly against fundamental liberal ideas about rights and rule of law. And we see a lot of uh, conflict there where a lot of the values of liberalism that underpin our legal system are seen as too expensive, too much of an inefficient luxury uh, for the modern neoliberal state. The weird thing about ne neoliberalism too is that it crosses political boundaries. Uh, we're seeing a lot of Labour governments around the world completely adopt the idea of neoliberalism. The Democrats in America have become very, very aligned with neoliberalism, have been aligned with Wall Street. And this has pushed many conservatives into populism. So you have the very strangely inverted position where the traditional people's parties are now hobnobbing with business and the uh, traditional conservative parties are having mass rallies and trying to whip up the populace into a frenzy. So these are indeed strange times. But this tension between ideas of an intervention and market economy are fundamental to the division in our justice policy today. Liberal legalism, or legal, legal liberalism, is often seen as the voice of old-fashioned values, insisting on the importance of fundamental ideas like rights and human dignity and respect and fairness, irrespective of the dollar value you can put on these things. And it's strangely enough, it's this is a position that seems to defy most other political positions today. That something that is so old-fashioned is something that is still seems to be very important because it seems to be under attack from all different political persuasions. So for justice students, having an idea of the different sorts of liberalism that exist, the different ways in which the word is used, can help you make some sense of the system that's built on those values. Even though that we don't really acknowledge it so much today, or that when we use those words, we use them in contradictory ways. And for someone who's a professional, whose role it is to, is to uh, work in those fields and to make sure those fields are protected from the things that would destroy them, it becomes a very important part of our ethical values to preserve those ideas and to make sure that we don't bargain them away.